as I meditated on these parables of the treasure buried in the field and the pearl of great price, and as I imagined myself being the person that goes and sells all that he has to be able to buy them, the thought came to mind of how very hesitant I am to buy something when I'm not sure that it's going to satisfy, when I'm not sure that it's going to work or that it's going to last or that I'm going to enjoy it as much as I hope. I hate the thought of putting time, money, energy into buying something and then finding out later I chose poorly. And I imagine many people out there feel the same way. What do we do when we're going to buy something expensive like a new piece of furniture or perhaps a new laptop computer or a printer or perhaps sign a 12-month lease on a new apartment? Well, we go and we look at the ratings and the reviews, right? And it's so nice when we find something that has over 3,000 reviews and they're almost all five stars. We know we're good to go. But Sometimes everything that we have available is around two to three stars and some people say, oh, it's great, I love it, it's the greatest thing. Other people are saying, this thing broke down after two weeks, don't waste your money. And I'm like, uh, who do I trust? Right? I don't want to risk it. I don't want to end up sorely disappointed. Well, the good news of the gospel is that heaven will not disappoint. That's what these parables assure us. Heaven will not disappoint. It will be worth every sacrifice that we have to make in order to get there, and it will offer us a greater joy, a lasting joy, greater than any of the pleasure or delight we could enjoy on earth. And this might sound like a pretty basic message that we don't need to spend a lot of time on, but I think we do. <laughs> I think we really do, because let's face it, the doubts come. The doubts can come that maybe heaven is not that great. Uh, maybe it's going to be missing something important. Uh, maybe I'm going to get bored. Maybe I, I really need to live it up here. If we do not think enough about heaven, if we are not totally convinced of how awesome it's, awesome it's going to be, then it will be easier for Satan to lure us into sin and trap us. So let's take advantage of these parables to help stretch our imagination and beef up our idea of heaven. In the parable of the treasure buried in the field, we hear that the man goes and sells all that he has and buys that field. And the question came to mind, why does he buy the field? Why doesn't he just grab the treasure and run with it? Well, if we're asking that question, then we're already thinking too small. For years, I imagined a two by three foot treasure chest filled with jewels or maybe gold medallions like in the movie Pirates of the Caribbean. But then the thought came to mind. You mustn't be afraid to dream a little bigger, darling. <laughs> and so if he couldn't take the treasure with him, if he had to go buy the field, it's because the treasure was too big to take with him. So instead of imagining some chest that we could pick up, better to imagine him stumbling upon a huge, vast, underground cavern, something like the Cave of Wonders in the movie Aladdin. This is what made it so easy for him to go and sell all he had out of joy, it says. No hesitation, uh, no uh, doubt, no uncertainty, no sorrow over the things he's going to be missing. No, out of joy, because he knows, after seeing that treasure, this is worth more than everything I own a hundred times over and a hundred times again. So for him, it's a no-brainer, right? Get rid of all this and get the field, get the treasure. This is how we're meant to think about heaven, right? Whatever we might have to sacrifice, it should be a no-brainer to give it up so that we can make it to heaven. Now, what of the pearl? The pearl of great price, the fathers of the church tell us they say that the treasure buried in the field is, emphasizes the value of heaven, the fact that it is all we will ever need. The pearl of great price emphasizes the splendor, the beauty, the sweetness of heaven, the delight that we're going to have from it. And this expresses the fact that it is all we will ever want. He sees the pearl and again, no hesitation, no uncertainty, goes and sells all that he has because he knows that there is no comparison to this pearl. He knows that having this one pearl is going to give him complete 
satisfaction. He knows, compared to this, all the other pearls that he's seen are as nothing. The dazzling beauty, the delight that he has in this pearl is incomparable. And so he goes and gets rid of all the others. It's as if he had never truly lived until he found this pearl. Have you ever heard someone use that expression or use it yourself? You haven't truly lived until you have tried this. I like to think that way about In-N-Out, In-N-Out Burger, right? I find out someone has never had In-N-Out. I'm like, oh, you've never had In-N-Out? Oh, come on, get in the car. Let's go. We're about to change your life. Right? Well, all the more so when it comes to heaven. When we behold the, the glory of God in heaven, we're going to realize I have never truly lived until this moment. And we're going to recognize that God is the only thing that we really can't live without. Oh, I thought I couldn't live without this or this that I had on earth, but boy, was I wrong, right? Like the merchant with the pearl, we're going to realize that the beauty, the delight, the pleasure, the splendor of heaven, that the delights of earth are nothing in comparison. What does St. Paul say in his letter to the Romans, chapter 8, verse 18? I consider that the sufferings of this present life are not worth comparing to the glory to be revealed in us. And I think it would be equally true, equally true if he had said, I consider that the pleasures, the delights, the beauty of this present life, that they're not worth comparing to the glory to be revealed in us. And with that, the thought comes to mind. Have you ever been asked the question, on a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your pain? Pain, uh, the 10 being the worst pain imaginable. Well, we could do the same thing with pleasure or delight, right? On a scale of one to 10, how would you rate your pleasure, your delight? 10 being the, the greatest imaginable on this earth. Well, then as I think of those words of St. Paul, not worth comparing, the thought comes to mind when we bring in heaven and hell that the scale we gotta use is something more like one to a million or even one to a billion. And I can almost hear the angels laughing. Go ahead, say trillion. You're still nowhere close, right? Another thought that comes to mind is imagining the greatest delight we've ever had on earth. I think of the, the most joyful moment that you've ever had. It could be, uh, could be having a delicious smoothie at Smoothie King. It was just so perfect. It could be uh, it could be that you heard something so hilarious that you just burst out laughing, you couldn't contain yourself. It could be the profound joy of coming together with family and friends after a long absence. Could be seeing something that was just so beautiful it took your breath away. Could be the exhilaration of being on the most awesome roller coaster. Whatever it is, find your happy thought. And now, in your mind, using our imagination, we can have the concept of 50 million instances of that delight hitting us all at the same time and be like, whoa, 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 righteous, righteous. <laughs> Heaven is better than that. <laughs> so let's not get all caught up thinking about the things of this earth. Let us not think that there is any pleasure on this earth that we can't live without. So many of us, we can end up clinging to serious sins for the sake of pleasure. It could be abusing drugs to get high. It could be abusing alcohol to get drunk. It could be sexual pleasure. Especially in our hedonistic culture, we see people make this the be all end all. We know, yes, God has put great pleasure in the marital embrace for those couples that are worthy of it. When a man and a woman are willing to make a total gift of themselves to each other and be bound by marriage, but so many of us can end up seeking this pleasure outside of that through sins like fornication or the sin of contraception so we can enjoy this whenever or wherever. Or it could be that we're divorced and remarried, in the, remarried outside the church and this would make it an act of adultery. Whatever our sin, we need to be ready to let it go and do whatever it takes to return to the sacraments. And I have the greatest admir admiration for those couples that are willing to live as brother and sister. They, they make the resolve to do so because out of true love, willing the good of the other, they realize, yes, we're going to do whatever it takes so that we can both make it to heaven. 
But I must say, it boggles my mind when we encourage someone to live as brother and sister and they look at us like we're crazy. Now, I've had this happen where someone looks at me like I'm crazy. They're raising their eyebrows or rolling their eyes. Like, Come on, Father. <laughs> how can you expect us to give that up? I mean, how can you expect us to live without that? And I'm thinking, don't you want to go to heaven? <laughs> don't you want to receive our Lord Jesus Christ who is waiting there for you in the Eucharist? Wouldn't that be crazy? <laughs> Let us not think, let us not act like the pleasures of this world are really that great. No, as, as if they're worth, worth dying for. No, they're not worth dying for. They're not worth going to hell for. And the third parable in, in the gospel of, about the net and the fishes makes that very clear that this is a possibility. After expressing how awesome heaven is going to be, Jesus lets us know that if we are not willing to pay the cost, then we will not get there. And what's the cost? Everything we have, all that we have. We need to renounce our sin, keep God's commandments, give our will over to him, carry our cross, whatever it takes. But it's worth it. Read the reviews of the saints, right? We talk about uh, reading reviews before buying something, before committing to that final purchase. Well, uh, read the reviews of the saints, those who know what they're talking about. And a prime example is St. Augustine. Right? St. Augustine, he knew the pleasures of the flesh. He knew the pleasures of sin. He lived for years with a mistress, had a child out of wedlock. And he thought that he couldn't live without them. For a while he was praying to God, God, please make me chaste. But not yet. Well, eventually he had his conversion and finding such delight in profound union with God, he didn't miss those former pleasures. And we have him expressing this in his confessions. He writes, Late have I loved you, O beauty ever ancient, ever new. Late have I loved you. He says, I plunged into the lovely things which you created, but you called, you shouted, and you broke through my deafness. You flashed, you shone, and you dispelled my blindness. You breathed your fragrance on me. I drew in breath, and now I pant for you. I have tasted you, and now I hunger and thirst for more. You touched me, and I burned for your peace. Then there's St. Faustina. I recently read this in her diary, paragraph 439. Listen to this. She says, The moment of Holy Communion. An extraordinary fire was enkindled in my soul. I thought I would die of joy and happiness. I felt totally immersed in God. I felt I was snatched up by the Almighty, like a particle of dust into unknown expanses. Trembling with joy in the embrace of the Creator, I felt He Himself was supporting me so that I could bear this great happiness and gaze at His majesty. I know now that if He Himself had not first strengthened me by His grace, my soul would not have been able to bear the happiness and I would have died in an instant. I'm thinking, I'll have what she's having. <laughs> Two scoops, please. <laughs> right, oh, oh, oh. Sorry, I thought I was almost starting to levitate there. Right, let's get excited about this. In heaven, we will have complete satisfaction of soul and body. Let's not make the mistake of just thinking on a bodily level, pleasures of the flesh. Uh, no, primarily it will be the joy of the soul, our higher powers, our mind and our will, seeing God face to face, the beatific vision, having an ever-increasing knowledge of him because he is infinite, experiencing the full force of his love and loving him in return, and enjoying all of this with family and friends who have made it there with us and even people that we didn't know on earth we will have perfect loving relationships with everyone no bitterness no envy no hatred no unforgiveness and we will all be rejoicing there together and then it's like okay sure the cherry on top our glorified risen bodies unable to suffer unable to die unable to get sick beauty strength beyond imagining glory greater than that of the sun 
Let us hope for this. St. Teresa of Avila, she was given a vision of our Lord's glorified hand. And just seeing the beauty of his glorified hand, she said that it was so great she would be willing to endure all the torments possible in this life until the end of the world just to be able to behold his hand again. That's just his hand. What of the full glory of heaven? Let us hope for it. Meditate on this often. Meditate on heaven. Ask God to increase in us the virtue of hope. The theological virtue of hope is what enables us to desire heaven above all things, to desire God as our ultimate happiness, and to trust in his mercy to help us get there. The greater our virtue of hope, the easier it will be to leave behind the pleasures of sin, the easier it will be to carry our cross, the easier it will be to embrace a vocation of celibate chastity, to renounce the great beauty and the pleasures of marriage as we hold out for heaven. And the greater our hope of heaven, the, the greater our appreciation will be for the Eucharist, for that foretaste of heaven that God gives us in the Eucharist, where we will unite with Jesus, the same God that we will enjoy in heaven with his full glory unveiled. He is there in the Eucharist, with his glory hidden in the host. The pearl of great price is Jesus. Jesus, bringing us into ever deeper union with himself, with God the Father and the Holy Spirit. I leave you with a a quote from St. Teresa of Avila. Hope, O my soul, hope. You know neither the day nor the hour. Watch carefully for everything passes quickly. Even though your impatience makes doubtful what is certain and turns a very short time into a long one, dream that the more you struggle, the more you prove your love for God, and the more you will rejoice one day with your beloved in a happiness and rapture that can never end. God love you.